My name is Eugene Allen Winkler. I was born and raised in Temple, Texas, born at King's Daughters Hospital, King's Daughters Hospital. And uh, the date was September 8, 1950. Uh, my parents are Gus and Esther Winkler. I have two siblings, an uh, older brother, James, who is three years older, and a uh, younger brother, Lester, who we call Les. Uh, he is four years younger than me. Okay, growing up in Temple, uh, we went to Emmanuel Lutheran Church, and that's where I went to school. Started in, we didn't have kindergarten back then, but we had first grade. So I went first through fifth grade at Emmanuel Lutheran and loved it. Uh, didn't know I loved it until I uh, started going to public school in sixth grade. But one of the uh, things that I do remember uh, that you wanted me to tell about is um, that when I was in probably the fifth grade, maybe fourth, it being a Christian school, we would have scriptures to memorize. And so uh, Mr. Lumens was my teacher at that time, and he was the principal as well as the teacher for the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And we were supposed to learn scripture as well. I did not memorize mine uh, fully, uh, maybe not as much as, at least not as much as I was supposed to. I remember that being a Wednesday because we had church on Wednesday evenings and we were always at church services. And so he uh, called me aside and I, he said, now for you to get a good grade, and for your parents to not know about this, you can uh, memorize that scripture, and I don't remember what the scripture was, and tonight before church, you come knock on my door, and I should be in my office, and say it for me then, and it'll be good. So I agreed I would do that. So we get there, and I was real careful to be sure that mom and daddy did not see me knock on the door or go inside. So when daddy was an usher and he went and started turning the lights on and all the necessary things, get ready for a church service, and mom would go inside with him into the uh, church building and sit down or maybe help with some things, get ready for uh, the offering envelopes. And so I knocked on the door and I went in, said the scripture for him, and uh, he said, okay, let's not do this again. I said, yes, sir. And I didn't want to do that again. So I opened the door just a little bit to look outside. Nobody was there, so then I slipped out. Mom and Dad never knew, never never found out about it. Um, yeah, born and raised in, in the Lutheran church. I was baptized. Uh, I remember that day well as a baby. No, I don't. But uh, I was told that my sponsors were Uncle Sam and as well as some others. But I remember Uncle Sam because he gave me a hymnal. And my day of confirmation, which was when I was 12, 13, no, 13, I guess. And for two years, we had to go on Saturdays during the school year. I think it was school year. We didn't do it during the summer. But every Saturday morning, I'd go. Uh, Daddy would take each one of us boys. Uh, and we would have uh, go to what was called confirmation classes. And basically, we learned uh, we learned so much about the Bible, a lot of scriptures, uh, but um, Lutheran's catechism and the things that he wrote down about you know what he learned and believed to be uh, truths from God's word is always based on God's word. And I was I was desirous of God's word, and I wanted to be a godly guy. Um, so I did that for two years. Well, upon my confirmation then at age, I think, yeah, I was 13 because uh, in, with the, uh, and I still have that hymnal, and on the outside, it was May 14th, I think, 1964. So I had not yet turned 14, so I was 13. 
Uh, yeah, Jonathan, I appreciate you saying this because that's the day I was saved. So I remember uh, kneeling before, and there were like maybe 10 of us who were being confirmed that day, and we were kneeling on these pads where they had the, the took the Lord's Supper. So uh, in kneeling there, he would move from each, from one to another, and he would place his hand on our heads and uh, pray over us and uh, speak words of blessing. Um, and uh, what are the scripture that he gave us? And I do not remember what that scripture is. Um, it's probably in my confirmation things that uh, mom had. I'm not even sure if I still had those things. But anyway, as he was doing that, and uh, the older children will remember, well, maybe all the children remember Emmanuel. Well, even some of the grandchildren who were there, that uh, at the front, there's stained glass um, of uh, Jesus with his arms outstretched. And uh, I remember looking up and there was something happening in my heart. I didn't know what it was. And I just knew I was, I had to say something inside. I said, Lord, I just, I want you in my life. I want you to be in charge of my life. And something happened that day because in Lutheran church, we didn't talk about getting saved. It was always joining the church, joining the church. So uh, for the next several years, and I even had Baptist friends. Oh yeah, I need to tell you a particular story. I had Baptist friends, they were talking about being saved. And so for the next several years and even getting into church work, um, I didn't know if I was saved or not. So it was maybe maybe as many as nine years, uh, at least six after that, that uh, every time I would start questioning whether or not I was saved, certain scripture would come to mind. First Corinthians 10 said, there is no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful. Four words. He would tell me to see, it's not based on your faithfulness. It's based on my faithfulness. And every time that scripture would come to mind, it was like it was shooting at the enemy, telling me, you're a loser. You're a loser. I'm a winner. God is faithful. He's done this. And it took a long time for it to finally um, settle with me that that's when I was saved. I was 13 years old, May 14th, 1964. When I was in Sunday school, um, about that time, I think it was after uh, my confirmation. I remember the room, and to my left was uh, a, a stained glass, whatever kind it was, I don't know. But, uh, and I remember who the teacher was, but there was a good number in, in the room that day. And as I was sitting there, I had my Bible in my lap and started thinking about my Baptist friends. And they would talk about getting saved and started asking questions that would come to mind. I said, well, what if, what if they're right? And then the question that really startled me was, what if we're wrong? And then I asked the question, so who's right? Uh, are they right? Are we right? Who's right? And right then, my eyes went down I know it is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now I know it. I didn't know it then. And my Bible is in my lap. Holy Bible. God is right. He's the only one who will always be right. And boy, that was so encouraging for me. I just find out what he says and whatever he says goes because he's always right. That reminds me when I was in uh, high school, there was a girl named Ninfa, a uh, Hispanic gal. She sat in front of me. And uh, no, this was junior high. Uh, she's such a sweet gal, Hispanic girl. And I remember her asking me one day, she turned around, she said, Eugene, can I ask you something? I said, what's that? She said, if you were to die tonight, do you know if you'd go to heaven? I didn't know how to answer her. I didn't know. I thought, what a question. I don't remember if I even answered her, but it just 
caught me by surprise. Those were things that God used and so many other things. It's about time. It was a group that it's when I had uh, met your mother and uh, we'd been dating. I don't think we were married yet. I worked for Mr. Martin. That was not one of the other jobs we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but um, it was in my heart to have a group and it was going to be our Lutheran, my Lutheran friends and the uh, had a lot of cousins there at the Lutheran church and invited them to be a part of it. And it was going to be where three aspects of the name, it's about time. It's about time we start telling people about Jesus. It's about time, the times we're in. And it's about time for Jesus to return. I mean, those three things. And as I shared that with friends, I said, this is what I have in mind. There'd be a panel. Gary folks would be the one who would ask questions for about four people, basically having to do with their spiritual lives. And then over here, we would have a light with a cross in the middle. And Gina played the piano for us. And there would be songs that would fit with the questions. And until, and this is, we went to Lutheran churches, basically, sometimes, you know, Methodist church, um, uh, or even a civic place. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, we even went to Fort Hood one time for the soldiers there. I remember Aunt Uncle Adolph saying one time, he said, Eugene, that it's about time group that you had. He said, that was so meaningful for me. I thought, wow, my uncle is saying this. And then when Dean was going to be deacon, uh, chosen as deacon at First Baptist, I got to, and I, I think I still have that cassette somewhere, but he gave me a cassette of um, his testimony, and he made comment in there. He said one of the greatest things that God used in his life was it's about time. I didn't know God was doing this. But it was always of Him. And I still have desires in my heart. It's the Lord's calling. Mm. And the way He put Gene and me together, we know with, knew within the first three months. And I even, <laughs> I've told the story uh, just recently. I said, you know, I've seen where the, our daughters would go knock on the door. And I see that at Gwendy's house, knock on the door. Can I come in? And somebody's even on the potty in there. And it's like a group session. Well, <laughs> I was in the bathroom one day and daddy let me come in and he was sitting on the potty and uh, had the vent going just to let you know that everything was okay. So I was looking in the mirror and I said, daddy, this is after I'd met her, I said, how do you know when you found the right one in your life? He said, Eugene, you'll know. When that happens, you will know. And I was looking at myself said, I think I know. I said that inside. I didn't say it out loud, but that's when I think I knew she was the one for me. Well, one thing that does come to mind, that, uh, a couple things really, when I was, it was about the same grade, um, maybe fifth grade for this, but uh, there was a girl who um, a lady, or her mother, brought her and was going to enroll her. Well, I couldn't tell who it was, but I could turn around and look out the door into the hallway, and um, I would announce to, the, to everyone what was going on. And I saw them talking out there, and uh, evidently the way it looked, the lady was talking to Mr. Lumens about enrolling her daughter. And so uh, as I was looking back there and I turn around and say, it's a girl. She's, her mother's bringing her to enroll in school, it looks like. And uh, so sure enough, that's exactly what it was. Her name was Michelle DuPont. And she was my first girlfriend. <laughs> and so after the fifth grade, uh, they didn't have school anymore there. They had to shut it down. They didn't have to, but some of the voting members decided it'd be best not have it anymore. And that was a sad day for me and for Les, although we really didn't know what was going on. 
So then I went to public school, Miller Heights uh, Elementary in um, just eight blocks maybe or so from where we lived. And guess who was there? Michelle DuPont. That worked nicely. But still at uh, Emmanuel, one of the things I remember was so embarrassing. Uh, Y'all know uh, Bernice Winkler, uh, my cousin. I always competed with her in singing. She didn't know it, but uh, especially in singing. But I also tried to get her to laugh, which was pretty easy to do. So we were both on the same. Uh, no, she was one row over, and I was farther at the back. And she'd turn around and look, and I would make funny faces and try to get her laugh. And she, uh, I made sounds with my mouth. And uh, so I remember if I was doing one of those things or both those things. So she would laugh and turn around again. And the teacher had her head down. I say her. I thought that was Mr. Lumens. Anyway, uh, Yeah, I think it was him. Anyway, he said, uh, Eugene. I said, yes, sir. He said, why don't you come up here at the front of the room and do that for everybody? Oh, no. So I went up there, and I stood, and he just let me stand there until I finally did it, and then I could go back to my seat. I think it was three hours, at least it felt like it. So finally I, I did it, and I think I went, I had my head down but, and went and sat back down. I was so embarrassed. He used to say I never did that anymore either. He was really good at uh, his ways of discipline. Um, so uh, sixth grade, um, uh, went to public school, and um, I realized there that we had learned so much better and more in uh, at Emmanuel because I was several weeks ahead, if not a month or two ahead of the students because of what they were learning, I had already learned. Now I've got to scratch my nose. And I thought, now that was so interesting that I already knew all of this and they were catching up to me, basically. Seventh grade, went to junior high at um, Travis, Travis Junior High. And Marmy and I were talking this morning about how we were embarrassed about various things. I think we were, she was telling a story about how Lindy was so embarrassed about something when she was growing up. Well, my embarrassment was that uh, Daddy was, uh, uh, he ground crankshafts. I know y'all don't know what that means, but he could work on a car, and his was a specialty where the crankshaft would get messed up, and he could go on site, get it all set up, and he would grind that round piece of metal till it was finally all real smooth, and he would use a micro, uh, he called mic in it, and uh, get it exactly right to get the right um, uh, parts on it so they could get it up and going again. And uh, so he would advertise and with uh, the station wagon, and he would use that to go on site for his jobs. Uh, got to go with him a few times, and I really enjoyed doing that. But um, whenever he would take me to Travis, there would be a line of cars and I would say, I'll just go ahead and get out here. And I would like five cars up instead of waiting till he got down to be let off. And uh, that was fine with him, but he didn't know I was wanting to do that. Well, he had had some signs made to put in the very back two windows on the side of the station wagon. And I was telling Marmy that I remember where we would and it fit that first station wagon. Second station wagon, he had to modify it to, to get it in there, and so I had to trim it off some. But he would loosen that screw on the trim, uh, take the screw out, and then he had had a bottle opener that uh, he trimmed off and then had a, drilled a hole through it. 
So he put it, put the screw through that hole, and it's what supported, latched that uh, sign into place. And I remember whenever we were going to go on trips or we needed it for the family, take all of his equipment out, take those signs out, and how there was a little ridge cut on the inside of those signs where we would slide it back into place and would hold the signs in place. Well, I was so embarrassed that he had those signs like that in the back of the station wagon that uh, just let me out early. And I think back and like Marmy said, well, that sounds like something you would do and using a bottle opener to, to hold that sign in place. Well, that's true. Yeah, these years later, I can certainly see that. So that was something we enjoyed talking about this morning. So I went to Travis for those years. That's where I started, uh, yeah, that's where I started playing the uh, violin. And Miss Bloomer was our teacher. She was professional uh, at uh, playing the viola. She could make that thing sound beautiful. And I uh, started in, I guess, sixth grade there. I mean, the seventh grade, because they told us what all things we could uh, do at uh, at school, and orchestra was one of them. So, Daddy went to a pawn shop and bought me uh, my my violin, and uh, used it all the way through eleventh uh, grade high school, and enjoyed the uh, orchestra in high school. I was, it would be like the, they call them the second strings. Uh, and that would be like the alto section of a uh, choir. And, uh, but I was first chair, always did so well. Uh, and um, Steve Taylor uh, was second chair, second strings. And uh, he would play flat and that would bug me so much. And so I would try to help him. So what I would do is I would play sharp to help him come up. Well, that made it even worse. And that was not helping anything or anyone. Um, I was thinking that there was anything else at, uh, well, then, uh, yeah. my what? Oh, thanks, yes. Uh, these teeth here are false teeth. Uh, they're caps. When I was uh, 10 years old, I was at a manual, at Manual Lutheran. It was after church one day, and we were playing around in Sunday school classroom. We were throwing chalkboard erasers at each other. And so I ducked to so it wouldn't I wouldn't get hit. And I remember who the other ones were, the, who the one culprit was threw it at me. But I ducked and went down and I hit a table. And one of the teeth broke off at an angle and the other broke off, half of it broke off. And got to those nerves and I would breathe in the cold air. That hurt so much. I could not drink water rushing past those teeth. I had to use a straw. Um, so uh, there was a dentist in our church. So daddy called him uh, Dr. Winchy. That's a German name. And uh, so went that Sunday afternoon and he worked on them. And so he said, I'm going to put ca temporary caps on them. And he said, now the temporary caps, they're going to, you're going to have these for six years because the teeth have got to stop growing. And so said, you can choose between silver or gold. I thought, I'm going to look like the black people if I get gold teeth. I don't want to look like the black people. I'll take silver. So for six years, I had silver caps on. And I remember whenever uh, you get a picture taken, I was always like this. Because I never wanted to show those front teeth. It took years after I finally got these, or, well, then after six years, then he put white caps on. And then uh, years later, y'all know Steve, and, uh, Steve Latchley, he said, I want to get you some good ones. 
And so he put these on when I was an adult. We were at Moss Bluff. So uh, that was 10 years old. So at 16, got the nicer ones put on. After uh, junior high, I went to uh, Temple High School. And, uh, well, wait, you wanted me to tell some of the things that we did at home. Our brothers and I, we had such a good time. We, we uh, made up games. I'll tell you some of the games that we did. We didn't have, uh, and this is the poor side of town. <laughs> but uh, we had ping pong balls, and we would just try to do different things. So we would play baseball outside with the ping pong balls. And we learned to try to throw curves and uh, top spin. And so our bat was a broom. And so instead of holding the broom, um, we held the broom handle and swung the whole broom around trying to time hitting that ping pong ball. Uh, that was fun. And that was something different. Uh, did we have bats and balls? Yeah, but this was something different. Whenever it would rain, we'd play inside. Uh, we did not have that back room when I was growing up. Um, and, and I've jumped ahead to these years here when I'm thinking of stories of when I was little. But uh, we would play in that, black room, that back room and uh, we had this little plastic basket and we thumbtacked it on the top uh, wood edge of the um, um, the cab the closet doors. And so that ping pong ball would fit just right inside there. So we would play basketball and uh, we would jump up and dunk it. Said, don't hit it so hard, you'll knock our basket down. That's right, so we would be real careful. Uh, other things we would do, we would make rubber band guns. I think our kids even did that uh, when we were, when they were home. But uh, we'd have a stick and drive a nail in the stick and with a, a clothespin and nail through that round, the uh, metal part of the clothespin. And so we would have rubber bands. We had so many rubber bands because our newspaper would come and it would have a rubber band around it every day. So we had hundreds of rubber bands. And sometimes there would be the small one, but sometimes there were some chunky ones, and those are the ones we used. So we had put it on the end of the stick and pulled it back into the clothespin and clip it like that, and then we'd aim it and shoot at each other or knock. We had little uh, army guys, uh, rubber um, army figurines, and we'd set those up and shoot them, knock them down. Uh, we enjoyed competition in that back room and one of the things we did, it became a war zone. And in the middle was uh, like demilitarized or, or it was that section where don't go into that area, you're gonna get bombarded with the, uh, uh, the ammo. Our ammo, we take the rubber bands and we get some of the newspapers and we'd roll them up pretty tight. So we'd make them about that long and then put rubber bands around them. So we'd barricade ourselves three places in that room, and then we'd say, go, and we'd throw at each other, and some of our ammunition was out there, so we'd run out of ammunition, and then we'd have to hurry up and run out there, and hopefully they were out of ammunition too, so I started, we'd pick them up and go back to our safety and uh, uh, throw again. Well, one time, Les had gotten out there and was picking uh, up uh, the ammunition and I threw to hit him. Well, I missed him, it went overhead and we had this square light fixture. It hit the nut on that light fixture and he was right under it and it came down and hit him on the head and broke into hundreds, if not thousands of pieces. And he went, Well, it didn't hurt him as much as it scared him. And then it scared me. And because mom then came in, what is going on in here, you boys? 
I think that's pretty much the phrase she used quite often. Uh, one of the phrases I remember her using, you boys better straighten up and fly right. I so much wanted to go fly to the right, but I knew I better not do that. Another one of her phrases was, wait till your daddy gets home. Oh, I did not like hearing that because he would uh, take matters in those hand, his own hands. Uh, and uh, uh, at least one time that I remember, uh, well, two times, remember when uh, I was going to get a whipping when I get home, and Daddy got home. And sure enough, I don't remember what I did. I don't think it was fly right. It was something else that uh, I did something to one of my brothers. Uh, and uh, so... Um, daddy got, he would either use, use, a lot of times he used his belt. You say, well, that, that's not nice. Well, he disciplined us and he spanked us, which is what we needed. He didn't know about the rod of correction. He just didn't know it, or he would have done that because he wanted to be a godly man. So uh, I remember him uh, talking to me and then start to whip me, and I was laying on the bed, and I, he would hit me. Well, really, it went right beside me and hit the bed. I'd go, oh, oh. Uh, he may have hit me once, but he missed me several times. But uh, that's where one of the places I learned to be an actor, and it, it really paid off. Uh, what was the other time? Is that the one you're thinking about? That's your Christmas tree. Okay, tell one other one. Uh, he was disciplining Lester one time, and I remember that belt coming around, and I was off just beside him, and he was spanking, I think it was Lester, and uh, I felt the wind from it, and I thought, I don't need to be in close proximity to Daddy <laughs> disciplining my brother, so I moved away and let, let him deal with him. Uh, and that was beneficial for years later when uh, I wanted to help a man who um, he was a smoker and he did not want people to know that he was a smoker. And I said, Lord, let me help bear his burden of that. And so for the next month, I had a hard time breathing. And after a week or two, I said, Lord, why am I feeling like this? And he said, you asked, you wanted to help Ray with his smoking, and I didn't need your help, but I'm letting you get in on uh, what he's going through. And I said, oh, I am so sorry. Please forgive me. Would you take this away from me? And it was gone, and I remembered back. When Daddy disciplines, let him discipline. So even with our children, when not our discipline, but when the Father's discipline, we've got to let him do what only he can do. Mm. So that was a good, good lesson for me. The Christmas tree. Oh. We got... Uh, live Christmas trees every year. Uh, and uh, what we enjoyed doing, Daddy enjoyed it, we would go out to, before going getting to the grove, we'd go off, y'all know, across the long bridge that y'all would hold your breath uh, for as we would go over that bridge to see who could uh, last longest going over that bridge. You, the children know what I'm talking about. Belton Lake. Belton Lake. Yeah, and Lindy was always able to go all the way across that bridge without breathing. <laughs> Her siblings would say, Lindy, you didn't hold your breath. Yes, I did. <laughs> she would go and breathe through her nose. <laughs> we got so tickled about that. So we would pass that bridge and then off to the right. Uh, the, uh, now it's called a park. It, there was no park back then. And uh, we'd go looking for a cedar tree. We got a cedar tree every year. Well, one year we could not, uh, two, three years, however, we quit doing that. 
and we, Daddy would buy a Christmas tree at HEB, which was now down the street from where we uh, lived on 28th Street, or 25th Street. Um, and I remember when HEB was uh, built there, the first time we went to HEB. So uh, they didn't have cedar trees, they had the regular pine trees. So that one year, I told Daddy, I said, I wanna see if I can keep this one growing. And so after Christmas, we took all the things off the tree and I took it outside and uh, dug a hole and put it in the ground, packed it real good. I'd water it every other day or so and uh, stayed green. It was, it was pretty cool. I really wanted to see what kind of root system it was developing. So weeks later, we were playing football and uh, one of the, um, I think maybe James, uh, kicked the ball and it bounced like this and it hit that tree and all the needles just fell off <laughs> and it was bare. It was a naked little pine tree and I thought, what? <laughs> So all that time, he was barely holding those pine needles on until it got hit by something. This thing is not going to grow. So I pulled it up out of the ground and took it to the trash. Oh, that was, that was funny. One time I remember, well, Daddy had this, uh, I'm going to back up a few years when uh, I was little. Uh, we had uh, lived down the street from Emmanuel Luther, and Daddy worked for uh, a man, and the man did not treat him correctly. Sort of like granddaddy, what uh, uh, Marmy was telling about uh, the lady not treating him correctly. So daddy decided he wanted to start his own business. So bought the house on 25th Street, and they had the city had to zone it for a business. And so he started his shop there in the back of the house. And people would come time and again, and uh, this one time, uh, uh, a man came and talked to Daddy about fixing his car, and there was a little girl and little boy. There were uh, brother and sister, and we were playing in the backyard, so they came out of the garage and came just to watch us. So we went over to them to talk, and um, so the little girl, I guess we were about the same age. I maybe was a little bit older, but... Uh, she asked me a question, and I said, no, ma'am. And I thought, why did I say no, ma'am? Because that's what we were taught. Yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And so to this little girl, I said, no, ma'am. And I thought, that's so embarrassing. I'll tell you one other embarrassing thing, because some of y'all who have, and especially uh, for Reggie and Molly, they'll understand this. But uh, my parents would work on me to keep me from fidgeting with my, my penis area. Well, I didn't know I was doing that, and uh, I didn't know why I did that, but I did, and they would say, Eugene, get your hand away from there. Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, sometime, you know, another day or two, Eugene, I didn't know I was doing that. I don't know why I was doing that. So um, we had pictures made. Our family came one time, and so uh, we got, and you know that uh, the photography was so different back then. We'd have to take a roll of film to get it developed. Then some days or a week or so later, we'd finally get the pictures back. So we got the pictures back, and we were looking through there, and here's our family, the backyard. Somebody took a picture of us. And I had my hand at that place. And I thought, oh, that's what they're talking about. And from that day on, boy, that was etched in my mind. I'm not going to do that again. So, uh, Reg and Molly, if y'all wanted to take a picture of one of the one doing that, that to show what he's doing, it was effective for me. I don't know if it would be effective for him or not. Um, so, okay, I'm in. Um, you got to tell about your driving the car when you were little, back in Oh, thanks. That's a good one. Yeah, I wanted to tell that one. Uh, grandparents lived just two houses uh, from away from where Ted and Bernice lived. 
and it was on a dead end street. It was a um, gravel road, and we went to see Grandpa and Grandma often. Daddy was so good about taking care of them, as you kids are taking care of us. So uh, we had this black car. I don't think it was ours. I think it was one Daddy was working on, and he wanted to drive it around, or maybe it was Uncle George's. Anyway, it was a black Pontiac uh, standard. And so uh, it was in the driveway. Well, everything is gravel. And uh, there was no, there was a garage, but it wasn't in, really intended for a car. It was for working inside it. Dirt floor. Uh, Grandma even had one of those wash machines that uh, had the open top and it would just wash them and then have to run it through that ringer. I always wanted to help. I wanted to play with that ringer. Well, we were there uh, one day and uh, I stayed, either stayed in the car or got in the car just to play like I'm driving. And I watched daddy so much. And so it was, it was up here. It was a stick shift. And I remember it was up here. Um, I don't think it was an automatic. I think it was standard. So I remember how he'd pull it down, and so I did, and I started moving. Well, I didn't know anything about brake or clutch, and I couldn't reach it because my legs weren't that long. I mean, I was, I was little. And so uh, I thought, uh-oh. So I remember what Daddy did. So I turned sideways, and I looked behind me, and I was steering like this, and he'd put his hand on the seat and started going down the hill into the, onto the road. Well, there were no cars coming because it was dead end. So I remember turning that steering wheel. And so I backed out into the street a little bit and it stopped. I was so scared. And I remember, um, I think it was James who hollered and said, Eugene's driving the car. And so daddy came out and I had already stopped by then and I was so scared. So he got me out of the car and didn't get after me. He didn't have to because there was no need for discipline. I knew I was done wrong. So he got in the car and drove it back up. I remember walking past my grandfather, grandpa. He was on the sidewalk going up to the steps and he was, he had, he would do like this. And he'd go, he was, <laughs> as I walked past him, he was chuckling. And I didn't think it was that funny, but they got such a kick out of that. Uh, another time, James hollered. Uh, when we were at home, we would, as y'all know, uh, Adams comes out of Temple. Well, Adams back then was two lane. Then they made it a four lane and there got to be so much traffic that they made it a one way. Well, the one street over was central and it was just a two lane street. And so we'd get up at the very top of that and it was a, an incline. And so uh, I'd start coming down that street and right in the middle, there was a, a section of rock you know, people would turn this way, turn this way, and I guess the rocks just built up right there and nobody ever did anything with them, didn't have to. So I had a little, uh, what we called a banana seat bicycle. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure, I think it was mine. Anyway, uh, I popped a wheelie right there. Well, the front wheel came off. I went, and I slid on those rocks and just skin myself up, elbows, knees, because we'd always wear shorts in the summertime. And so I pushed that thing home and holding the front wheel and trying to get that thing back to the house, and I was hurting. Well, another time, another thing we would do is ride our bikes real fast through the, uh, the alley, and then we'd get out onto that uh, central and then coast down before we got onto uh, 25th Street. And uh, there weren't any cars to, to speak of that would come on that street. Well, this one day, I was going down uh, the alley. Man, I was 
getting with it. And I turned to get out onto Central and I looked and there was a car right there. So I laid it down and I slid on my hands uh, and stomach and uh, that car ran upon the, the wheel, or at least the front wheel of that bicycle and uh, didn't hit me, but it messed up the bicycle. And I remember hearing from the backyard, two houses over, Eugene got hit by a car. And I think that was James as well. So he, he was always watching out for me or, or just water. He happened to be at the right place at the right time. Uh, that was scary. So, of course, I quit doing that. Okay. Think of anything else? So, um, went from uh, middle school, I mean, uh, we can call it middle school, junior high, Travis Junior High, to high school. And um, still in uh, orchestra. Um, I no stories that come to mind to, to speak of there. But I remember saying that, uh, telling mom and dad that it was always mama and daddy back then. As we got older, we got more mature and it changed to mom and dad. So I talked with them about not being in the orchestra anymore and said, really? I said, yeah, because I don't know, I've got friends. It's been good, but um, the friends I had there, the ones I played with, Steve was the really the only close friend I had there. Well, there were some other ones in the choir, and I, I'd like to take choir. And I said, okay, well, that'd be fine. So I joined the choir, and Dwayne Marshall was the uh, director. Well, he was just fantastic. Uh, the band director was really good, but he was not our orchestra director. There was another man that did orchestra, and he was okay, but uh, not real personable. But Mr. Marshall, man, he was superb. So I uh, enjoyed choir there, and I got elected to be president of the choir. Uh, and uh, so I enjoyed that year. And then uh, upon graduation, um, I remember a story that comes to mind the day I graduated. And our graduation back then were in the football stadiums. And, uh, of course, that's where we had ours in May. Usually it was nice weather. So I had it all set up there and, you know, had the pomp circumstance, music. And um, I know this is uh, seems so prideful, and it was as I look back, but I remember, do you remember the lady who sat across from us at that last reunion? Um, we were at that table with, uh, anyway, it was her husband. They were boyfriend and girlfriend, ended up getting married. He was such a fine guy. Well, whenever he'd carry his books, he always carried them like this. And I thought, boy, he looks smart. And he was smart, but he even looked smart the way he held his book. Well, he did that with his diploma, too. I thought, wow. So I thought about that when I was going across the stage and uh, getting my diploma, so I tucked it away just like that. <laughs> I thought, so suave. You know, I wanted to look so suave. And even someone said, boy, Eugene, when you were coming off that stage, you looked so neat the way you were holding that. I thought, wow, it really worked. <laughs> But as we were leaving, uh, and they were playing the uh, postlude song, we walked across the, the field, uh, going to the other side, and that's the first time it ever dawned on me that I'm graduated from high school, and I don't know what I'm going to do. It's a little emotional as I think about it, because I didn't know the Lord was so involved in my life. I didn't know he was showing me things and wanting to tell me things, you know, even from uh, when I was younger. But anyway, walking across, and that side was empty. There were no people. No one was over there. They were all on this side. And so there was a, a thought that I don't know where I'm going for my future. I don't know what I'm going to do for my future. Well, James had gone into the Navy. I went into the Navy, um, or, or uh, you know, that was one thing to do, especially with the draft coming up. That was going to be a concern. 
Um, but Temple Junior College, that's what all my friends really were doing. So I figured that's what I would do too. So sure enough, and talked to mom and daddy and said that, felt that that was what I needed to do instead of just getting a job somewhere, they wanted me to continue my schooling. So I appreciated that. So I um, started going to, um, signed up at Temple Junior College and I didn't know anything about, well, I wanted to still be in music, so I signed up for choir. And uh, I think maybe there was an audi auditioning or something because uh, I met Miss Marshall and told her that uh, I'd been in the choir of high school, been in the orchestra. And so, yeah, I think so. I sang some for her and uh, she said, well, there's a court airs. Uh, there were a group of four guys and that uh, she would like for me to consider being in that. And I said, yeah, that'd be great. So she put me in the court airs. So I got scholarship for court airs and I guess choir also. And then um, she said, and I want you to sing in the madrigals too. I didn't know what the madrigals was. So she explained a little bit and said, sure, that would be fine. And I guess the main reason is I was able to get scholarships and it was not going to cost to have to go to TJC and living at home. And so uh, that's what I did. Well, right out of high school, um, I mentioned the draft. And so the way they would do that is they would like pick a number out of a hat, a date with a certain number. And they start with maybe one, two, three, four, all the way up. And uh, I remember what my number was, uh, but. What, how was that date related to you? For September 8th, my birth date. And so uh, mine was chosen for September 8th was number whatever. Well, they were in the low numbers. And this is the same thing that happened to James. So instead of going to, uh, into the army and being in ground um, warfare, um, he looked at joining the Navy and went to a recruiter. So he had joined the Navy. And while I was in high school, he was in the Navy and had been there for, mm, I guess, in 68. So about the time I graduated, he, he went in. And uh, so he didn't go on TJC. He went right on into the Navy. So in talking to Dad about it, and I said, you know, my draft, this is my number. It looks like I'm going to get drafted. He said, well, let's, uh, let's see what uh, openings they have. So down the road from where we lived was the National Guard Armory and the office there. So we went. Uh, he took me down there, and we looked at... Um, uh, me join the National Guard. So in talking with him, he said, well, we don't have any regular openings right now for National Guard, you know, and that's basically like Army, but you're on guard uh, and you'll be going for training, but it's a different uh, section of Army. So uh, he said, but, so we don't have any openings right now for that, but we do have... Um, Airborne. I said, what's airborne? He said, well, you'd be jumping out of airplanes. I don't think I want to jump out of an airplane. <laughs> Daddy, could we go somewhere else? And he said, well, thank you for your time. And he said, yeah, well, if you decide differently, you know, come on back. So I walked out the door. I don't think I'm going to be back here. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> don't plan on it. I didn't tell him that, but I was thinking that. So uh, he said, well, there's some downtown. There's the Army uh, and there's the Navy. And I said, well, James is in the Navy. I'm about to check that one out. Okay, yeah, let's do that. So we went to Naval, um, talked to the Navy guy, recruiter, and he said, well, we have openings in Navy Reserve right now. I said, well, what's Navy Reserve? He said, well, all of them are six years total. He said, but this one you will be, first two years you'll do inactive. Uh, you will um, serve, uh, you will go to classes to Waco uh, on Monday nights for three hours every Monday night. And uh, then during the summer, you will go for a week, uh, two weeks. Um, you'll do boot camp. And then uh, the second two weeks, you'll be 
uh, going on a ship somewhere. I said, oh, okay. And, uh, and then after those two years, then you will go two years active duty, and then you can finish up your last two years inactive. I said, sounds fine. So I took a test, and um, right there, and he graded it, and he said, well, it looks like you're uh, really strong in, um, you're mechanically in inclined. Uh, and I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, you're, you have mechanical abilities. You, you probably like to lurk, work with motors. And I said, oh, yeah, well, I had worked with Daddy in the shop. I was really called a grease monkey because I just wear shorts and I'd work with him and I'd get all uh, grease all over me and my feet were black and we'd use lava soap and I'd scrub my feet um, in, at night. And uh, I worked on motors with Daddy. As a matter of fact, there were times where he said, Eugene, I need your help. And he'd get me up underneath the car. He said, I need you to push the transmission up and hold it right here so I can get that bolt put in there. Well, I'm not that strong, but I could do that. And uh, I really enjoyed that. And like Marmy said, that she really thought she was granddaddy's favorite. I thought I was daddy's favorite. Never told my brothers, and I still won't tell them that, but. Those are your little fingers. <laughs> Oh, Daddy would say, Eugene, I need you to tighten this nut for me here. And I said, okay, well, why do you want me to do it? He said, well, my fingers are so big, and I need nice little sweet fingers to do it. But I have nice little sweet fingers. I don't want to be known as having nice little sweet fingers. So I tightened it down till it, you know, because it was pretty long, and then he could get a... a a wrench on it to tighten it. Um, I'll tell one other story about uh, James wasn't out there very much, but he would come and look. Well, two stories. But this one here, it was a tool, and I like working with tools. And uh, so this one of them, it was uh, opposite of um, pliers. You know, you open pliers, they're like this, and then they clamp down. With this one, you push down and it pulls out. So I asked Daddy, what's this for? And he said, that's to open up the um, clamps, the battery clamps, the, what goes on the battery. And so to open it, you put that in there, and it, you push that, and it opens it up. Said, oh, okay. So I was playing with it. Well, James was out there looking uh, at watching Daddy work. And so I was working with this, and he was standing right there in front of that car, and I looked at his rear, and I looked at this thing, and I went, and I pulled it, and I pinched his one of his buns. He went, ah! <laughs> started running. <laughs> he started chasing after me. Eugene pinched me. I didn't know it would do that, but now I know what it, it could really do some harm. Um, one other story is when I was helping Daddy. Um, he asked me to he wanted me to get the nuts on a uh, the starter. So I'd been down there, and he told me how to put the cables on, and, and so I was doing that. Well, I had found this ring. It was really cool. But as I kept looking at it, I thought, that thing looks familiar. There's something interesting about that. Well, come to find out, somebody had cut the end of a, um, I think it was probably a spoon. You know, the fancy design on the end? So they cut it and they bent it over and made a ring out of it. So it was a fancy design ring. Well, that's pretty cool. So I was wearing that. And so when I got down there to put that bolt on, well, the battery was still hooked up. And that got between the positive and the negative, and it burned a ring on my finger. And I carefully took that off and, you know, I mean, I had first degree burns there. And I took that thing and I threw it as far as I could. <laughs> Whoever finds it, they can have it, but I'm not going to do that again. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, a friend of mine, a good friend, we grew up together from Emmanuel Lutheran, 
Uh, we didn't go to school together. He was a year or two younger than me, David uh, Lindemann. His daddy owned a golf service station there on Jenner Bruce Drive. And so um, I don't know if I asked him or I think he may have asked me if I would like to work there on Saturdays. Uh, as a matter of fact, as he mentioned it, and then he talked to his dad, so went and talked to his dad about it. Uh, he was a tall man, and he was a Sunday school teacher at our church, um, and he was very lucrative. Uh, I mean, he was very conservative with his money, and so uh, asked me if I wanted to work. It'd be from 8 till 5 o'clock, I guess, on Saturdays, just Saturdays. And so it was okay with mom and daddy. And so daddy would take me every Saturday uh, and started me off at 65 cents an hour. And after several months, or maybe a, close to a year, I guess, then he bumped it up to 85 cents an hour. Well, I was probably 15, 16 years old. They didn't have the laws then like they do now. So, you know, we could work and make some money and, um, but I remember, I think it was when I was making 85 cents an hour that I wanted to purchase something and it was 20 bucks. That was going to be a lot. I made $5 after taxes. I made $5 and 20 cents every Saturday. So I took that away and had, uh, uh, if Joe would know about it, it was in my sock drawer and uh, he could have found it. Uh, but I saved up enough money to purchase whatever it was. A um, couple things about the, uh, that job. I always wanted to help people out. Well, um, there was this one guy came in one time and had a Cadillac. And, and like Marmy said, it was not self-service. They would not allow people to serve themselves. It was full service. Uh, but uh, David's dad, he was good at servicing vehicles and having us to wash them and they wanted, he would check them out and be sure they were clean. I mean, even inside where you open the door and you had the inside portion there, the inside portion here, down the floor, up above. I mean, we used those chamois and that thing was perfect. Uh, so I learned to do that there. Um, but to this man came in with Cadillac, he said, fill it up. And so while the gas was going, um, and matter of fact, even some of those, they didn't have the self uh, turn off. We had to be real careful and just to, to watch it uh, so it wouldn't come out um, and spill over. So uh, by then we had the cutoffs. And so I remember putting gasoline in and I wanted to get it all the way up to the top. So, you know, he didn't have to stop for a long distance. And so then I'd put some more in and and I put some more in and I thought, is this thing ever going to fill up? And I thought, okay, well, I better not do any more. So I closed it, closed the, uh, put the cap on it, put it away. And the man paid Mr. Lindemann and we had checked his oil and um, washed his windshield. That's what we did full service. And sometimes they would ask that we would check the tires. And so we'd make sure there was enough air in the tires. Uh, but Mr. Lindemann was smart. He said, you check that oil. And if it's a little bit old, uh, low, he said, you let the customer know how low it is. And he said, if it's a quart low, and he said, I've sold a lot of oil by letting the people know. So the guy drives off. And so I was walking toward the building. I turned around and looked. Here's a puddle of gasoline on the ground. I thought, oh, no. I said, David, David, what's this? And he said, What'd you do? And I said, oh, I just kept putting gasoline in. And he said, oh, there's an overflow up underneath of these Cadillacs. And so when it turns off, you just take the nozzle out and put it away. I said, I didn't know that. He said, let's wash that down. So he got the water hose, started washing it down. He said, so whenever it cuts off, just let it be cut off. Um, but had a good time trying to, especially like the 56, 57, 57 Chevys, trying to, he would kid with me. Because uh, I'd look to see where to put the gasoline in. Well, the license plate, sometimes behind the license plate, it, that wasn't budging. And there was nothing on either side of the car. 
and he would stand off to the side and he would look at me and he was smiling. I went, where is it? So he'd come out and uh, for the 55 and 56, you had to turn this latch at the light, the back tail light, and the whole assembly would come down and that's where you'd put the gasoline in. And uh, that was interesting. So that was 55, 56, 57, yeah. Did you own a car? Uh, I was saving up to, to buy a car. When I was in high school, I had saved up enough money and it was like, uh, was able to buy a 56 or 55 Chevy that a guy was selling and I think it was like $300. That was a lot of money. Uh, matter of fact, it may not even been that much. But anyway, I had saved up enough uh, that I could purchase it. And boy, I wanted to fix that thing up. You know, I put those flipper things on the uh, tires, on the wheels. and But that was extra money, and I didn't have that. So I, I bought a few things at a time. So I wanted to put chrome on it. So under the hood, I bought a chrome oil cover. So I put, bought that, and then uh, the air cleaner. I bought a uh, chrome air cleaner. It seemed like there was one other thing that I bought. Uh, and so uh, after school one day, uh, went home, and I uh, thought I better check the oil. All of it was gone. Somebody had ripped me off and stolen all of that out from underneath, evidently while I was at school. And they were checking various cars. So I didn't do that anymore, but I took a chain <laughs> and ran a chain above that hood and put a, a lock on it, and they weren't going to mess with mine anymore. I got thinking, there's nothing else to steal under there. I don't know why I'm putting, putting this uh, chain on here. Oh, well. Uh, and then what well, James had bought before he went to Navy. He had bought a uh, Chevelle. I used to say Chevelle Malibu, but it was just a Chevelle, not a Malibu. That's a different, different one altogether, a little bit fancier. Beautiful blue. And so uh, he was going to sell it because he was going into the Navy. And Daddy was a Ford man, always buying Ford. And so James said, I'm going to have to sell it because I, you know, I won't need it while I'm in the Navy. He said, well, let me buy it from you. So Daddy bought it from James. And uh, so then after I had that uh, 55, 56 for a period of time, um, that Chevelle was sitting there. And I thought, I wonder if Daddy would let me buy that from him. And so I talked to him. He said, yeah, you, know, you sell yours and start taking up payments. So I took up payments on it. Uh, and with that money I got from mine, paid the down payment, and so I had that the rest of the time. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why Gina fell in love with me is because of that, that beautiful Chevelle. Do you remember how much you paid for it? Brand new, it was $2,850. I think I bought it from Daddy for about uh, a little less, around 2000 because it was it had, had it a couple of years. And so you made Monthly payments? Right. Mm -hmm. Paid it off. $65, I think it was, a month, which was a lot. And so I started at the uh, Gulf Service Station, but then found out that there was a position. Daddy found out because he dealt with uh, Goodyear Tire. Uh, Mr. Yock worked there, and Daddy always bought his tires there from Mr. Vic Yock. And so uh, there, he was saying that they needed some help. Uh, you know, breaking down the tires. And, and so he asked me, would you be interested in that? And I said, yes, sir, I sure would. So I called and talked to him and got hired on there. And uh, that was a uh, ten an hour. So I was bumped up from 85 cents. And plus I got more hours during the week, and which helped me to pay on that car note. And then uh, James had worked for HEB. And he was fast, he was left-handed, but he learned to do the cash register and that was the punch type. And um, he'd punch this and then hit a button and it would ring it up and add, keep adding it up, adding up, adding up. And uh, he was really good at that, I watched him do that. So now he was in the Navy, and but um, he got to be good friends with the guys um, 
there at um, HEB uh, management and worked some extra hours, you know, on uh, Friday nights after football games. So I called them and talked to them. He said, we got a position in the drug department. And I said, well, I'm interested. And he said, come on. So I put an application in, got the job, $1.25 an hour there. So, man, I'm moving up. And so being in the drug department, that was where the toys and the um, uh, uh, magazines and anything that was not of uh, food items, feminine products. So my boss, he was uh, the man a manager over that section there. I don't remember his name. So he would be leaving at four, five o'clock, and I would work until closing till nine o'clock. And uh, he'd give me a list of things to do and, you know, uh, put more toys out, uh, always arranging. You know, the kids would go there and they'd play and with the toys and mess it all up. So I had to go and put things back. And uh, so one of the things that I did not look forward to whenever it was uh, he'd give me that list, I'd look down at it and feminine products. So I'd have to go to the back and, uh, well, I have to go check to see what needed to be put on the shelves. And sure enough, I needed eight packages of this kind of feminine product, four of these, and did that, you know, for all the things in that area of uh, cosmetics. And um, so I was so embarrassed. So I would uh, wait to see if there were the fewest number of people in that area. That's when I would go and take care of that problem. And so I'd get those up on the shelf really fast and then move on to something else. And that triggered a story of what uh, would embarrass me as well. When we were at home, uh, we didn't use uh, a dryer. I had a dryer, but after washing clothes, then, I mean, it was a lot cheaper to put them out on the clothesline. So mom would do that. She'd put them out on clothesline. Um, but then she would have us to take them down. And so, um, you know, we were in a secluded area over there. Y'all know where Grandma used to live. And so he said, Eugene, bring the clothes in. Yes, ma'am. So I'd take that uh, basket out and start taking on uh, the clothes down. And, of course, there were, you know, three of us guys, Daddy and then Mom. Well, and then I'd come to her panties. I let it drop in the... I don't know why. And then her brassiere, the, I let it drop in there. <laughs> I think back, uh, that was so silly, but it's just underwear. But I didn't want anybody seeing me doing that either. Uh, the drums. The drums. That was good. I wanted to play a musical instrument when I was younger, so um, Daddy would purchase things at Sears and we'd pay for them month by month. Uh, and I didn't know that was really costing us a whole lot of extra because I only had to pay $15 a month. Well, I could afford that or even less than that. And so uh, got a guitar one time, tried to learn to, excuse me, play guitar, but uh, I didn't do well with that at all. And uh, then I saw this set of drums when we went to a uh, toy store, and boy, my eye caught those drums. I, oh, I'd really like to have a set of drums. So I talked to mom and daddy about it. And uh, so sold the guitar. I don't remember what we did with it. But uh, anyway, then got the drums and uh, put them upstairs. Daddy had uh, one one bay, he called it, of the garage. And that's all he had for when for years, where he'd work on one car at a time. He could work on cars outside in, when it was nice weather, uh, but he'd have to swap the cars out. Well, then he talked to Uncle Adolph about building another bay, so it'd be double, which is now the garage that everybody knows about. But uh, it wasn't that way for several years. 
And so he wanted the uh, top portion, that uh, the peak area, to be a game area for us boys. And so Uncle Adolph said, yeah, he can do that. So he built that up there. And if y'all have been to Reggie and Molly's, uh, where he has his drums, they're same, so much the same as what uh, I grew up, my brothers and I grew up with. Um, his has more room for his than what we had, but still the same idea. So uh, I would uh, play those drums and I'd turn the music on real loud when, well, and Daddy, you know, he had the shop up underneath. And so I couldn't play the drums while he was there. It'd have to be uh, either before or after he worked, probably well, not before because I didn't get up that early. But after he finished work and he'd go in the house, then I'd go play the drums. Or if he'd go off on a job somewhere, then I'd get up there and play them. I mean, even in the heat of the summer, we didn't have air conditioning. I'd open the windows, but I thought that's pretty loud too, so I didn't even open the windows, maybe just a little bit, and turn the fan on to try to stay cool enough. And boy, I'd practice and I would watch guys. I got to go to some um, concerts and we would go to the back and watch that drummer and how he did it. And I started learning on my own and that's how I learned to play the drums. And uh, I remember I didn't know daddy would had come home that one time. And this was more than once, but especially that one time. And boy, I was playing and then uh, after the song would quit, then I would just play, play, play and try to think of how to do drum rolls and go with the, um, the cymbals and the hi-hat and <sighs> finished and I looked and there was the door that was in the floor and it was up. He was watching me, he said, Good job, Eugene, good job. Months ago, Reggie was playing, and I pushed that up, and I watched him, and I thought, deja vu. I'm like Daddy, looking at me, and here I am watching Reggie play his drums. Precious memories. <laughs> So good. Well, um, it brings us to, I guess, to when I met that sweet gal and Jonathan had asked if I'd move on into when we met. Well, I told you I was in high school, uh, joined the choir, was there for a year, graduated. Well, the first few times I was uh, going to classes at TJC, um, that one day, I'd already signed up for um, choir and the uh, Cordaires and Madrigals. Uh, we really hadn't, we hadn't met yet with the Madrigals, and I think we had already met with Cordaires. Uh, so I was getting my feet wet there. Well, before going to Madrigals that afternoon, uh, I thought, well, I'm going to go to the high school and go to the choir. Well, you know, there was no... Uh, security then like there is now. So I just went into the choir room and I uh, was looking around the corner and Mr. Marshall was directing the choir and he saw me after he cut off the music and he said, those of y'all who don't know this guy, this is so complimentary. And uh, he said he was a great president and uh, this is Eugene Winkler and they applauded, you know. So uh, the bell rang soon after that. So I went to the door and was just standing off to the side and all the students passing by. And uh, they were saying, hi, Eugene, hi, it's good to see you. Hi. And so this one girl walked, was walking by and she stopped and she said, uh, my sister, are you going to the Madrigals now? I said, yes, I'm going there in a little bit. She said, well, my, I'm pretty sure my sister is in the Madrigals. And I said, oh, really? I said, yes. And what's your name? Uh, my name is Clawson, Eva Jo Clawson. What's your sister's name? Gina, Gina Clawson. I said, okay, well, I'll see if I can remember that name and 
see if she's there. Okay, so she left. Never thought any more of it. So got in the car and went over, sitting in uh, the room. And there were two rows of desks, really, in this classroom. There was a chalkboard there. Uh, if the grandkids don't know what chalkboard is, uh, you parents can tell what the, tell your kiddos what the chalkboard is. So we were waiting for Miss Marshall to come in. The gals, there are, I think, six, mm -hmm. six girls, and then there were six of us guys. And I was at the far end, and we were talking. I think I was talking to Jimmy, um, one of the friends from high school, and several of them there from high school that we knew. You know, we already knew each other. We didn't know what Madrigals was going to be. We were about to find out. And, oh, I remember that girl's name. I said, hey, is there a, is there a Gina Claus in here? You know, the six girls in front. Well, this girl was at the other end. She leaned back and she said, I'm Gina Clawson. I said, oh, well, I met your sister at high school a while ago when I went to the choir. I said, oh, yeah, she's in the choir there. I said, oh, okay, yeah. So she turned around, looked, face forward again, and I thought, boy, is she pretty. Whoa. And uh, I thought, I want to meet that girl. So it brings it up to that point there. Is this when we're supposed to do it together? Do it together. 